Hello everybody to another VC video of my making. Now I guess it is a part of uh, the vinyl community culture amongst those that make this kind of videos that you always try to come up with some new interesting or intriguing idea about records and about music in general. And I'm often very inspired by that. Um, so I thought uh, let's uh, try something uh, which probably reflects my experience with uh, the vinyl community quite a lot and that has to do with uh, me liking albums that uh, have a tendency to be unpopular amongst record collectors or just music fans in general um, even or particularly within uh, a certain fan base of a particular band. So uh, there are those famous records that are probably more accepted by people that are not diehard fans of the band in question, but are pretty much scathed and hated by those that proclaim themselves as uh, true uh, followers and fans of this band in question. So that's a very convoluted entry to this video. So I called this uh, Breaking the Lands, which uh, is, uh, is an expression that actually I believe does exist in English, but uh, it's probably not being in use, in use a lot. And uh, on the other hand, in German, uh, the, the, the German uh, version of this expression, Die Lanze, Brechen is uh, very much a kind of popular thing to say. Obviously it means taking the part of someone or, well, how to say it better. Uh, it is uh, an expression that means that you step up and defend something that uh, is being attacked by the rest maybe. Um, I actually thought if I use this in this video, it's kind of my personal intellectual duty to find out where this expression to break a lance for someone, where this actually comes from. And it took a while to figure that out. Um, I don't know if this originates from Germany. It could be simply because in today's German language this expression, this saying, is certainly much more popular, much more in use than probably in English-speaking regions. Um, but it goes back to the age of uh, knighthood and the famous knight tournaments, when uh, uh, you had this kind of a theater-like open-air setting where uh, fully armed knights were charging towards each other uh, and attacking with each other with this huge lance. And uh, there was a tradition, almost like an unspoken tradition or an unspoken rule, where in certain situations, because each of these, this was like a duel and as a, as a duelist you would have your second, um, or a squire that would be your assistant and uh, often after the first charge uh, both knights ended up thrown off the horse uh, and uh, I mean their lances were often broken it was not unheard of to continue uh, the fight on the ground often with swords now um, if the situation looked rather one-sided, where for example one of the knights was still lying on the ground and had a bit of a hard time getting up and maybe was a bit hurt or just his arm was broken or something like that, while the other knight was already advancing towards him, then it was not unheard of that uh, the squire second to the knight in distress could move between these two and uh, he could, for example, pick one of the remaining lances uh, because each of these knights had a rather huge amount of of uh, weapons and lances available. If, if one bursts, you could quickly replace, replace it for another one. 
So this squire could just take a lance and just move between these two and kind of try to keep the attacking knight at bay. He would not really fight him or attack him, but more kind of annoy him and just slow him down so the other knight would have uh, enough time to get back on his feet, hopefully. So this often led to the situation that the advancing and attacking knight, who already went through a probably very hard fall from the horse and was already pretty much pumped up on adrenaline and testosterone. Um, so it often happened happen that this uh, advancing, attacking knight would just sort of angrily smack his sword against this wooden lance being shoved into his face. By the squire and probably more often than not was able just to break this lance and uh, so that's where this idea of breaking the lance uh, comes from this expression where you basically become this squire uh, taking the side of someone lying down so oh this was really exhausting <laughs> but actually it's a very good exercise for me when it comes to practicing English being forced to to uh, speak about stuff that is uh, kind of slightly outside of my my language and verbal uh, abilities but enough of the history lesson and uh, let's talk about music so today i want to break the lance for its heart by the who on a record that came out in 1982 and basically marked uh, the end of The Who and was for a long long time the last album and uh, is one of those records and a good example for what I was saying before that uh, there are these albums that are being more or less collectively hated particularly by the fans of a band um, and probably are being a little more accepted by people that don't feel that much invested uh, in in a band like The Who and um, I always opposed this uh, judgment over this album because I think it's a great record. It's not only a good decent album that would still be a reason enough to defend it but uh, I think this is a huge misunderstanding because this is an outstanding record and uh, for me easily one of the top three albums they ever recorded. So uh, that's why we are here now and uh, this is my effort, my try to defend this record and uh, to break the lance for it. So um, amongst many things, the one thing that makes this record interesting is a strong presence of John Entwistle as composer here. And honestly, I was never a big fan of his songwriting, particularly in the 60s where he was... Uh, well, basically responsible for these kind of whimsical, quirky, uh, kind of left fieldish tracks that, uh, well, always felt a little too weird for me and might have been practical during live concerts, giving Roger Daltrey uh, three to five minutes time to save his voice a little bit. But um, I always felt that his songs were a little too ugly and a little too weird for my taste. But his songwriting on this record is incredible and we'll get to that. So this album begins with Athena, which is an outstanding opening track and in a sense like a flawless pop song and yet weirdly whimsical and kind of quirky and it's filled with these typical The Who uh, mannerisms, you know, this this very lively slightly outlandish rhythm, guitar, and uh, there are all kind of interesting ideas like leaving out the snare beat on the two and only keep it on the four and it creates this kind of nervous, urgent energy to the song. It has an amazing, amazing intermezzo with this kind of fascinating keyboard sounds and Pete Townsend suddenly singing a part. So the, the entire track is actually at least that is what the lore says. Uh, the track is about Pete Townsend being rebuffed by Theresa Russell, who um, at this point in time started a relationship with uh, 
Niklas Roque. So one only wonders, one only wonders how the song line and now you are stuck with a castrated leader relates to this. <laughs> but it's one of those wonderful lyrical lines that only Pete Townsend can come up with. Now the next track is It's Your Turn. I know you don't like to hear me saying that, but this is one of the best The Who tracks ever recorded. And it's written by John Antwistle. It has this incredible drumming by Kenny Jones, um, who just on a technical level was most certainly a better drummer than Keith Moon, um, which doesn't take anything away from Keith Moon. Um, I'm just saying that uh, there are drumming styles applied on this record uh, that probably come more from a kind of a studio drummer uh, set of techniques and styles and uh, this is certainly a good example of that. There is this totally kind of psychedelic guitar uh, screaming in the background um, giving this whole track this strange almost otherworldly texture so wonderful, wonderful song, uh, beautifully written by John Antwistle. Rest in peace, John. Um, the next track is Cooks County. Uh, here Antwistle is playing one of his greatest bass parts, by the way. It's a wonderful track. Uh, I mean, the bass is totally commanding here and basically making the song. Uh, and then comes this very kind of hectic hectic chorus with these harmony vocals uh, that sound so strangely detached with completely wild guitar playing by Townsend. Just brilliant, brilliant stuff. And this song is about the reality of life in uh, big city hospitals, you know, in emergency hospitals. And um, I mean, throughout my life, on occasion, I met doctors that worked in hospitals and yeah, the stories that they can tell, uh, that makes kind of your face freeze, honestly. And um, I, I think this this track kind of captures this uh, incredible tension that is just uh, part of the daily life for those doctors. Now, the next track is the title track, It's Hard. And that track is just fantastic. First of all, I love this intermezzo that happens in the middle of the track where everything suddenly slows down and um, there is just this soaring of this music back to this kind of tripping groove. There is also this strange Englishness about this track, I feel. I don't know why, uh, it makes me think of, uh, of uh, football songs and people getting drunk and this type of stuff, which is actually kind of deep in the, the Who territory. Uh, maybe it borrows from a certain type of folk music or something, I really couldn't tell. But uh, there is this brilliant line uh, saying, any stud can reproduce, few can please, which again is such a typical Townsend line. Oh, how I can relate. And um, brilliant track, outstanding music and uh, just very cinematic in some weird way. Quite original. Um, yeah, what next? Uh, then we get to Dangerous. Now this is a kind of a storming the castle type of track with a great riff and very energetic. And there's this chugging bass kind of running the show again. Um, I guess this song kind of feels like a callback to a theme not untypical for the Who about violence in the streets and uh, the whole Brighton Beach thing with the rockers and moths. And, uh, but at the same time, there's something slightly dystopian about it and kind of like a, it feels like a post-apocalyptic song to me in a way. It's another track written by John Entwistle. And finally, the A-side closes with Eminence Front. Now, Eminence Front is uh, the one song that is somewhat accepted uh, by people from this album. It's another great 80s example of putting this uh, idiosyncratic uh, Roland CR78 
drum patterns to good use, rather well known from uh, In the Air Tonight by Phil Collins. Um, as a composition, it is just convincing and yet such a, such a powerful, simple statement that even your usual blinkered haters of this album have a tendency to give this song a pass. Also very hilarious that over the entire verse sequence of this song, uh, John Entwistle is basically playing only one note on his bass, kind of like boom, for four bars, which in a way, in a strange way, it's kind of a tongue in a cheek thing, I think kind of uh, making Thunderfingers look lazy. It's a song with Pete Townsend singing the lead. Yeah, I think it's spot on. It's one of the great pop songs of this era, actually. And it's a song that will just be around 50 years from now, I'm pretty sure about that. Well, provided that we as a human enterprise will still be around, which is a completely other question. The lyrics of this song or the statement behind the track is uh, very kind of observational and kind of capturing the spirit of the times back in the day. I mean, the rise of the neoliberal yuppie culture and... Uh, consumer culture and uh, something that actually continues until today which is this glorification of the rich uh, while the entire world is basically turning into shit yeah i mean read my fucking t-shirt man so a uh, brilliant song i really love it and uh, it's one of the cool songs of the 80s just uh, listen to this kind of orgiastic bass playing during the refrain. That's some epic stuff. And then you turn over the record and start with the B-side, which begins with a track called I've Known No War. Now it feels to me like uh, I've Known No War is a kind of a return to a theme that uh, Pete Townsend had visited a lot during his songwriting through the years and decades. I think it's a theme that keeps appearing in work like Tommy and Quadrophenia, examining a certain aspect of Pete Townsend's generation, which kind of grew up or was born and grew up on this rubble of Second World War. Uh, and yet, uh, at the same time, this kind of shadowy historical event was this defining theme during their childhood and yet it remained strangely detached and elusive as something that uh, the older generation would not talk about or at least talk about only in a very particular way. And uh, I think that's something that has always influenced Pete Townsend, where you are basically forced to live with a certain atmosphere, a certain shadow hanging over you, often combined with a certain finger being whacked in your face all the time and yet it's about something that happened before your time and that you can't always relate in the way this older generation expects you to. And I'm not surprised that Pete Townsend once said that uh, this is probably his best composition, uh, which um, might be actually true, but it seems to me that I'm the only person actually taking notice of that. Um, just listen to this wonderful intermezzo uh, within this song when suddenly this kind of a cinematic orchestra comes in in a really big way and it suddenly sounds like something from, I don't know, like the Alan Parsons project. Amazing stuff. Suddenly the music is so cinematic and dramatic and at the same time very very loose and playful, probably one of the best arrangements that The Who ever did. Quite outstanding. But I guess that's when it becomes a little heartbreaking, uh, when people completely dismiss an album like that, because they totally miss out on a track like I've Known No War, which is so fascinating and such a great production. But when I say heartbroken, I'm being hyperbolic. Don't worry, I'll be fine. So let's have a sip of coffee. So how, how am I doing so far? Have I in any way ignited a certain interest in this album? 
just to give it a listen on Spotify or somewhere. Um, yeah, let's get to the second song on the B-side, which is very unique and very interesting in itself. It's a very short track, which is called One Life's Enough. And I'm deeply convinced that One Life's Enough is single-handedly the best vocal performance by Roger Daltrey ever recorded by him or by the band. The performance he delivers here is outstanding. And how bold to get here completely out of his comfort zone and become for three minutes this almost choral singer with this rather conservative style of singing. So there are no raspy screams, no roars and no shouts to hide behind. From a vocal point of view, this is complete nakedness of the artist, of the singer. The music feels deeply sentimental to me at this point, with a touch of, I don't know, Eric Satie and the Twenties somehow percolating through the song. At least that's how I hear it. Now the song, as I said, is only, I think, 2 minutes 20 long. Painfully aware that the Who fans have no tolerance for this type of music since it does not animate you to get drunk or to throw bricks through somebody's window. But I love this underlying sadness so beautifully carried forward by Roger Daltrey. Also great keyboard work by Tim Gorman who played the keyboards and synth on this entire album. The next track is One at a Time which feels like a classic The Who song with this kind of fist-clenching vibe. And again, an amazing half-tempo intermezzo and uh, another great opportunity for Daltrey to shine as this roaring rock singer. And the whole track has this great, almost drunk energy, but it's also kind of quirky and even somewhat unusual. Now, uh, the next track is Why Did I Fall For That? and is the third John Entwistle composition on this record and stylistically it's probably the most conventional song on this album. Uh, it's pretty upbeat, almost a cute, happy song but at the same time, and that's what makes it somewhat subversive, is that it has again this rather dystopian lyrics about decline and the fall of social structures Wonderful uh, guitar work by Pete Townsend here. And then this totally original keyboard sound by Tim Gorman, sounding like some kind of an arcade computer, computer game of the 80s. Um, two more tracks to go. The penultimate track is A Man is a Man. Still a rather slow song, giving Daltrey a chance to, to present his pipes. So this is uh, vocally a very mature and rather sophisticated song about the nature of masculinity and the social traps and expectations associated with it. It has a very strong melody, great song and uh, some great 12 string guitar sound. The last track on this album is Cry If You Want. Again, it has this kind of totally intoxicated bass sound by Antwistle. Um, I mean, you could hardly make a song more The Who-ish. Uh, it has this agitated and uh, fretful demeanor, but the vocal melody is quite outstanding. And as a composition and production, it really has this very, very strong handwriting that makes it immediately recognizable as a The Who song. So. Overall, do I find any major flaw with this record? Well, probably the only thing about it uh, that is a bit of a letdown is probably just the cover. The cover is very boring and uninspired. And um, honestly, I don't understand why Pete Townsend had not called me. I would have designed him a much better cover basically for free. But... Uh, Maybe it's because I was only 11 years old when this album came out. <laughs> so um, yes, um, the major question that people have a tendency to ask over this is would it be a better album if Keith Moon had been alive and played on this? Yeah, maybe. I mean, it would probably have raised a certain level of energy on this album to a much higher ground and uh, this would probably be a good thing. 
On the other hand, I think a lot of these songs are set up in a way where it does not need this type of aggression or on the drums or this type of kind of caveman testosterone that uh, Keith Moon loved to project, but um, it benefits more from a very technical drummer that uh, has rather a kind of studio musician sound and um, I never had a problem with Kenny Jones drumming here. I think he's an outstanding drummer and for me the way this album sounds he seems to be the perfect drummer for this record. It's just I think people are just extremely sentimental about the fact that Keith Moon died so untimely and um, they kind of let it out on other drummers just projected as something uh, well in a rather unfair way to be honest and I mean even people in The Who did that you know just slagging Kenny Jones off just for not being Keith Moon. Tough call, really a tough call. So overall I think shitting on this album has become just far too convenient to some people to kind of vent their inner sadness over uh, Keith Moon's absence but um, I don't think it's a fair approach and uh, it probably should be appreciated how much work The Who put in to make this album sound as good as it does. Now I don't expect you to rank this album above uh, Who's Next or Tommy or Quadrophenia, but it's kind of not conceivable to me that people making ranking videos and making a ranking video about the Who albums then rank this record below Who by Numbers or Face Dances or Endless Wire which are all significantly worse records, significantly, by a mile and more. But then again, we all live in a highly subjective world and the idea of objectivity is basically a shameless lie. I hope you know that. So um, I hope this was in any way interesting to you. I may continue this, it's certainly a good exercise for my English. And uh, I have a whole stack of records that I really, really like that people have a strong tendency to constantly shit on. So, um, yeah, I have a lot to say about all of that. So, see you till next time.